today we're going to look at grace and truth. A out of John chapter one verses sixteen or fifteen through seventeen. They're not a concept that's explained until we get to the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I put up there at the top of this that grace and truth don't appear in the same verse at all in the Old Testament. The closest that we have to it is found in in Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verse 3 and 4. And Solomon is introducing us to the concept of wisdom. And wisdom is a symbol of Jesus. Uh, if you read through for the first chapter, and starting in verse 20, it says, Wisdom cries outside. She utters her voice in the street. Wisdom is really Jesus. And the word wisdom is feminine. That'll make you women smile. But it's actually Jesus and should be he because it's the symbol of what Jesus is all about. And it should read, Jesus cries outside. He utters his voice in the street. Jesus is always calling to us, is the concept. But in verse uh, 4 and 5, 3 and 4, in chapter 3, he says, uh, Forget not the, your commandments, uh, for length of days, life and peace shall be added to you if you follow them. And he says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Uh, One has to be in search of truth and continually going after truth to find what the wisdom of Scripture is all about. He says, bind them about your necks, write them upon the tables of your heart. He says, so shall you find, uh, and the word used here is the word for grace, and your Bible may say favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. So the closest that we have to grace and truth coming together is in verse 3 and 4, where truth is given first and grace is given second. And it's really the word favor. The the key to grace and truth is how you go about searching for them. You know, it's the Holy Spirit's part in our lives to impress upon us the need for truth. And I don't care who you are. Uh, I don't care how many people you know. There's always somebody you're going to know that looks at truth and says, nah, that ain't right. It's not right. And it happens even to believers because we, in searching for truth, we have to overcome the things we've learned from our past. Uh, And it's not easy to do. Imagine being a Muslim and you've been taught that that, uh, there's only one God and uh, the the last prophet was Muhammad and everything. He said, you know, how do you overcome that when your whole family has been believing that? Uh, It's not easy. But the New Testament really defines the relationship clearly. Searching for truth will lead you to grace. Uh, As one seeks truth, then one encounters grace. And the furtherance of both are found only in Christ. That's an unavoidable truth that just cannot be undone. If you search for truth then what happens is grace comes into the door and you have to accept both to get any further in life as far as your spiritual going goes, as far as your spiritual growth goes. So I put down here John 1, 15 through 17. John bore witness of him. He cried out saying, this is he of whom I spake. He comes after me and is preferred before me, 
for he was before me, talking about Jesus. Of his fullness we have received grace for grace. Uh, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And then I list some thoughts about what this whole thing is really about. What is grace and truth really about? And it's really about getting to grace. Uh, The sole task of our lives is to bear witness of him. That's what the Great Commission is all about in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, And I didn't put all these verses uh, down here, but I've got a list of uh, six verses that tie grace and truth and witnessing all together. Now, that's what the Great Commission is all about. It, It really says, and if you read it in the Greek, it would say, you all must go. So see, we're... We're commanded by God to go into the world and and be a witness is really what it's all about. He says you must go and you must teach all nations. Anybody that comes into your life, no matter where they come from, you have to teach them. And sometimes it will lead to baptism. Uh, It says, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he said, you must teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, that's part of what the final words of Jesus were as he's leaving the earth. Uh, think about this. All of Scripture is written about our sal- about salvation. Yeshua is the Old Testament word for salvation, and it's a feminine word uh, that ends in A-H. And to shorten it, to make it masculine, all you do is drop the H off the end, and it becomes Y-E-S-H-U-A, and that's Jesus in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, the common reference in in, um, synagogues that believe in the Messiah, the Messianic synagogues, is Yeshua HaMashiach. And it's Yeshua, of course, is Jesus, uh, and HaMashiach is the Messiah. But it really says, in Hebrew, it says, salvation's the Messiah. It's always translated salvation, and it only occurs about 20 times in the Old Testament. But the word salvation occurs, and it's the word Yeshua. Uh, All of life, all of Jesus' life, was about providing a doorway of entry into eternity. That's all, that's all he taught. Think about it. Uh, the guy was born and raised, and from the time he was in the synagogue at uh, an early age when his parents ran off and left him, and he was there teaching the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, he was teaching them what the truth was all about. And, of course, they rejected it. He went away and stayed away until he was 30 and came back. And they still rejected him. Uh, But all of Scripture is about the Old Testament predicting Jesus and the New Testament illustrating that he came uh, to provide this doorway into eternity for us. Now, there's two doorways into eternity. One of them goes to the heavenly kingdom. The other one goes to hell for eternity. So it's a matter of which road you choose. And everybody chooses one, either consciously or unconsciously. Uh, They either accept and and believe in Jesus or they reject and deny Jesus. And the world's full of people like that. Majority of people in the world reject Jesus. Matter of fact, it looks like it's coming to a time when it may be a criminal offense to believe in Jesus. But all of the ministry of Jesus is about bringing people into the sheepfold. He's the shepherd. The entirety of his life is all about that. We don't know much about his young life, whether he ever learned to work with wood as a carpenter or not. But we know his dad, his stepdad, uh, Joseph, was a carpenter. 
But we do know he preached in the temple from a very young age. He came back and preached in the temple more from the time he was 30 until he was crucified. All of the suffering that Jesus did on the cross is about paying for our sins and the sins of the world. Now, I can't imagine what kind of burden that laid on Jesus, but let's just say all the sins of the world forever, past, present, and future, were laid upon Jesus as he went to the cross. That, that, that's horrible. That's horrible that he endured all that. Just to get us into the kingdom. So our lives, as a result, should be about witnessing. Witnessing to others. Now, does it mean you have to go out and carry Bible tracts with you and pass out Bible tracts and, and shake people by the collar and, and try to bring them into the kingdom? No, it doesn't. Uh, sometimes it's just prayer. I mean, the women that ministered to Jesus, it's no record of them having ever led anyone to Christ except the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And she led a whole town to Christ. There are no disqualifications in Scripture. It's just over and over again to go and be witnesses. The point that we have to remember here is Jesus is going to come back. And everything that we've done in life Good, bad, and ugly is going to be dealt with. Uh, the first advent, uh, he called a group to be faithful. And that small group of 11 men minus Judas plus one extra disciple, whether you consider it as Thaddeus or whether you consider it as Paul, is irrelevant. But there were 12 disciples who went out to disciple the world. Think about that. 11 of them stuck around, and Paul went to the Gentiles or to the nations and and became the witness uh, of God's presence in the, in the, in the world to the nations. Uh, and he's going to come back. He not only came the first time, but he's going to come back in a twofold episode when he takes those believers Everybody that's a believer out first, and I believe that's going to happen before the tribulation, the rapture of the church. And then he's going to come back at the end of the great tribulation to establish the millennial kingdom on earth. Uh, it's interesting that, that after a thousand year reign of Jesus on earth, there's still going to be a rebellion against him. So you understand living in perfect peace and harmony and love for a thousand years doesn't cure the hearts of man. There's no cure for the evil that's in the hearts of man. There's no cure for the logic that corrupts our hearts and keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. But he's going to come back and take care of it all. He's going to come back and hold us accountable. The question is, what constitutes a good and faithful servant? That's what we have to think about. Uh, when we get to heaven, uh, there's going to be this distrib distribution of accolades or rewards or however you want to put it. And uh, I'm not sure how it's going to, because it's never explained in Scripture, I'm not sure how it's going to all happen. But think about this. God says to some, enter the, uh, my kingdom, good and faithful servant. So what does it constitute for us to be a good and faithful servant? What, what the, how do you answer that question? How do you answer, what, is, what have I got to do to be a good and faithful servant? And there's a lot of people who've got opinions about this. It's not a question of what people's opinions are. It's what does God tell you to do? That's what makes you a good and faithful servant is your obedience to what he tells you to do. That's it. It could be praying with a neighbor. I mean, it could be, I don't know, taking food to someone that's ill or visiting them in the hospital or, or taking care of uh, widows and orphans. I don't know what it is for you. I've known ever since I got saved that I had to lead people to Christ. I knew I had to do that. 
because that was one of the things I read. Uh, he he said uh, in Acts 22.15, you shall be his witnesses. And I thought, well, that's talking to me. i got to go be his witness. And so I began praying and looking for opportunities to do that. And, and God provided them because I was bold enough to ask. And God provided them in a way that didn't scare me to death because I, I was a, I was a wretched sinner before I got saved and I wasn't sure if God was going to use me at all. But all you got to do is pray. God use me. Show me what to do, how to do it. Tell me what to say. And he, he does it. Uh, The reason we do, the reason we have to be concerned about this is because uh, there's only one God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, Trinitarian nature. Now, a lot of people don't believe in that. And I understand that. But the entire first chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, the first word for, used for God is... is uh, Hebrew noun, masculine, plural, which means there has to be at least three, not just two. There's single words, dual words, and, and plural words. And plural can be more than three. I don't want you to misunderstand. But the concept, the concept of the plurality of God in Genesis is the first word used for God. He is the only one. And the Son, because He is the Word of God that God speaks, and we learned that from John chapter 1, the words that God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence with was Jesus Christ. And it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all right there. So I personally believe in the Trinity. I, I don't argue with people that don't. Uh, I don't argue with a lack of understanding. I just say you can believe whatever you want. I just leave it at that. But Scripture tells us that Jesus is not just a way into eternity, that he is the only way. Uh, and many believe that he's just one of many ways. And that's just not what Scripture te teaches at all. Uh, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So they, he, he eliminates all other processes. Uh, Matter of fact, in the third century, uh, they established at uh, the first, the second and third church councils when all the believers got together uh, and were trying to work out what does Scripture say. They came up with uh, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, uh, and those state the Trinity the belief in the Trinity, that they're coexistent, co-equal, all that. That little diagram I showed you with the circles on it, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all came about as part of that process. And that was in the third century. And the, the Nicene Creed was at uh, the Second Church Council in Nicaea and happened in 325. Uh, now, as with any good religious group, people didn't agree on everything. And so by the time the seventh church council came together, there was a division. And they started holding the church councils only in Rome. And the Eastern Church, which was the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, didn't attend any more of those. And the councils in Rome declared the Eastern religion uh, as being all wrong. And there have been many church councils since then. Uh, but not all of them with 
everybody in agreement as it was in the first three or four, at least. There were seven that were accredited uh, as having happened in agreement, but they didn't agree on everything. Don't get that in your mind. Uh, division started early when it became a power struggle, and that's the way it still would be today. It's a power struggle. Matter of fact, they tried to translate scripture in many different uh, centuries since then, and you can't even get theologians that are all Christians together in a, to translate scripture and them agree on what it says. That's why we have so many translations of scripture. But Jesus says he was the only way. And I put down uh, a reference to verses here uh, in John chapter 1 and 3 and 1 John 4 and Jude 1 that affirm that, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all part of the Trinity and, and coexist and co-eternal, uh, share the same knowledge. They're really the same person, just manifested different ways. And the scripture is very specific about this. It also says that God is eternal. He had to be in order to create the heavens and the earth because God was in existence before the heavens and the earth were created. And I've told you that the definite article is not there in Genesis 1.1. It's not there in John 1.1. So it's in a beginning, not in the beginning. Uh, there is no the beginning explained in Scripture for where where God came from. He created uh, space, uh, time, and and uh, matter. It says that uh, not only God's eternal, and I gave you verses for that in Deuteronomy and John and Romans and Timothy and Titus, but it says that God's word is eternal, uh, and that's verified in both the Old and New Testaments. I only gave you a few references because there, there are a lot of them. Uh, it says that because of those qualities, Jesus, uh, the word, is also eternal because he's the word of God. He's also eternal. Uh, now, where does all this lead us? It gets us back to the verse uh, that the law was given by Moses and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, Moses gave the Israelites a list of commandments and ordinances for the temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, that they were to follow to live in the land of Cana. Now, the reason that God did that is because the Canaanites were godless people. Uh, they worshipped uh, uh, sacrificing their children uh, to in a fire, uh, Baal worship. And they also had these poles, uh, dancing poles, and I'm sure it's much like the dancing poles today in the bars and places uh, where... A uh, free-for-all took place, I guess would be the best way to put it, called Ashtoreth Poles. And they were given over to indulgences uh, between men and women that Scripture doesn't even go into. But it's the same thing that happened with the calf in the wilderness when God destroyed them, opened up the earth, and they all fell in. <clears throat> That's just an open pit to hell, those things. And he says... So I'm giving you these rules to follow because you're going to be among a godless people. And he told Joshua, he said, when you go in, I want you to kill them all. And Joshua didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't finish the job. He got tired of always being gone away from his family and always on the battlefield killing people. And it, wasn't, it was men, women, children, and all the animals. So God wouldn't accept anything from them. He said, that's the only way the land will be clean, is if you do this. So technically, they live in an unclean land still, and that's obvious. Uh, there's a Palestinian organization called Hezbollah that's trying to 
send rockets on them and destroy them to this day. And they haven't, ne- they'll never get rid of that. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> scripture predicts that, uh, Jerusalem will be overrun again. And, and they'll all flee to the mountains, the, the ones who believe. And they'll end up trusting Jesus as their savior. But it may take his second coming before they get there. How many will be saved? I don't know. But God has saved a remnant for himself. And that much is obvious. Uh, and he, he established all this. I put down here God's laws in 5a. God's laws for Israel to keep in uh, failing to look for their Messiah, for their Redeemer. He, he gave them all these rules and regulations to follow, which were, for the most part, I, I, I hate to say this, but they were almost unkeepable. It called for ritual sacrifices and all this. Uh, and uh, the whole thing was just, if you go through and read the Levitical laws, it's, it's mind-boggling that God would place that burden on somebody. But he did that for their own benefit. And I put down here in 5b that the laws were for Israel to abide by in the land of Canaan, which was really an ungodly environment. So if they if they were searching for truth, truly searching for truth, then what, what they would find would be the grace of God, especially in the New Testament. Uh, and the Old Testament, it was hard. Because the Messiah was preached, but most people didn't read Hebrew, and most people didn't have copies of Scripture. Think about, I mean, it was really an illiterate group. It wasn't until the Romans took over that literacy probably came into the being in, in, the, in the promised land. Uh, anyway, it says that grace came by way of Jesus, really. And if you just remember that grace really stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. It's really what makes the difference. If you're really searching for truth, then what it's going to lead you to is the cross. It's, it, it has to lead you there. Because they're, they're intimately connected. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Before Jesus came, Almost the whole world was lost in trying to find the truth. When Jesus came, truth came. And he even says this in witnessing to uh, Pilate at his crucifixion. And I put down in, in the seventh point, <clears throat> we all struggle with truth. And when he said to Pilate, uh, Pilate said to Jesus, are you the king that I've been hearing about? And Jesus said, you say that I'm king and to this end was I born. For this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. <clears throat> so there's a lot of people don't want truth. They would much rather live their lives and, and in their fake uh, palaces that they've built uh, denying truth to accumulate their wealth. And then Pilate said to him, what is truth? What's truth? See, this kind of tells you that Pilate was lost. Pilate didn't get it. Right? It doesn't mean he couldn't have gotten it later on because he could have. And it says, when he said this, he went out to the Jews and says, I find no fault in him. People that really search scripture, especially uh, those who are really looking for truth. I don't care what religion, what background, what ethnicity they are, what country they live in, it doesn't make any difference. If they're really looking for truth, they're going to find it in this book. That's just the way it happens. Uh, there are a lot of Jewish people. Uh, that have given up looking for the answers to their heart and soul in 
the practice of their religion and have actually picked up scripture and read it and found Jesus as the result of it. You got a question? No? Good. I probably couldn't answer it. But Jesus sets the whole thing straight in John 14, 6, when he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father, that's grace, except by me, which is truth. So you see, grace and truth are connected in such an intimate way that if you're seeking truth, what you find is Jesus at the end. If you're seeking Jesus, what you find is truth at the end. Either way you go to get there, it, it, it leads to the same point. You end up knowing and understanding what Scripture is really all about. I, I don't give you this uh, task in life uh, too lightly. Scripture says, uh, I, I'm to tell you what the truth says. And in, in Titus 1.13, matter of fact, I was talking to my son this morning about he, he sometimes is kind of harsh with answering people about uh, what Scripture is all about or Bible study or, or whatever. His, his philosophy, and I guess he got this from me, is if you want to know Jesus, you study the Scripture. If you want to know what somebody else does, says, then you can go get another book off the bookshelves because there's thousands and thousands, maybe millions and millions of books written about what somebody thinks this book says. But that doesn't count. That doesn't count. That's that's additional stuff that you may or may not need. And I'm not saying that that some people don't have input. It might be worthwhile. They might. Uh, on your copy of the outline, I put down here Adrian Rogers at three lines from the bottom. <clears throat> Adrian Rogers was a great soul winner, led thousands and thousands of people to Christ. Uh, when we first got married, we were members at Bellevue Baptist Church <clears throat> in Memphis, Tennessee. <clears throat> and I mean, there were sometimes so many people coming down, it looked like the congregation was empty. And this was in a, this was in a a auditorium that sat several thousand people. He would give an altar call, and I mean, hundreds would come down. And I accepted Christ at Bellevue Baptist Church. Uh, But he said, you're either back, you're either soul winners or backsliders. And, I don't know if I agree with that because there are people in the church that have different gifts. And I'm not speaking against Rogers. I believe everybody should be praying for somebody to get saved. Uh, And that makes you a soul winner if you have that heart. But there are two parables in Scripture. In Matthew 25, there's the parable of the talents. And uh, it's really God gives us different gifts. Uh, Albert Einstein obviously had a gift of that far exceeds most people's ability to think uh, with an IQ of 160 or something like that. Uh, uh, Margaret Voss Savant, uh, one of the smartest women, uh, has this ability to think things in different ways than I, I could even imagine. Uh, She once had a quote that said, uh, what happens, somebody asked her, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? And uh, her answer was, something new is created. I wouldn't have have come up with that. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, But evidently we have, God gives us different degrees of advantage. But it's what we do with what God gives us that measures our fidelity. Uh, and then in, the, in Luke chapter 19, there's the parable of the pound. 
Uh, one of them is talents and one of them is pounds. Uh, and they're not saying the same thing. They're saying a similar concept two different ways. In the parable of pounds, they're given exactly the same thing. And they're able to do something different with the same thing based on their abilities. Uh, different degrees of improvement with the same opportunity. And so I always look for the talents or the pounds in people who are looking for where is their ministry? What, what am I supposed to do in my life? How am I supposed to be effective and be in God's kingdom and become a, a good and faithful servant? And these two parables teach us how to do that. Uh, there was a kid that uh, we met at uh, First Baptist Houston. We were in a young married adult class when we were young. And uh, there was this couple that came in. I don't even remember their names. Uh, but very modestly uh, uh, endowed. Uh, but they came to and joined our Sunday school class. And uh, they had a son that had, uh, I, I don't know whether he was, uh, he was, he was challenged. I don't know what the challenge was, uh, but uh, he uh, he had trouble learning and had learning disabilities and stuff like that. And he was only about six or seven years old. And somehow he got introduced into Jesus by somebody along the way. And he ended up leading both of his parents to Christ. Uh, now obviously, the kid had limited ability. But what he did was lead his parents to Christ, and they ended up in our Sunday school class. And uh, and then about eight months or ten months or a year later, that son died. And they didn't even have the money to do the burial. They, I mean, these people were bare subsistence uh, level people. And so the Sunday school class got together and did the funeral. Paid for the whole thing. And we were the people that went to the funeral. And there was not a dry eye there. I mean, people were wailing and bawling uh, like babies. Men and women didn't make a difference. Uh, all because this challenged child had led his whole family to Christ. So it's not about what we think we have. It's about what are we going to do with it. And this little boy wasn't afraid to call his parents on the carpet and get them in the kingdom. Uh, obviously, he went to the kingdom, and and they they join they're going to join him one day. I'm, I'm not even sure if they're still alive. Grace always leads us to truth. Truth always leads us to grace. <clears throat> and if I, I I I found Christ because I was interested in finding truth, I was on a search for truth. Uh, I ended up in Hebrew and Greek because I wanted to know exactly what it said uh, so I could tell people the rest of my life. Uh, fortunately, I've led people to Christ. Uh, but not everybody gets to do that. I, I don't. I understand that. So there has to be other measures along the way. But I don't know of anybody that should not pray for the salvation of somebody. There's somebody that needs to be saved, and God's put it on your heart. Uh, because our job is to be witnesses. Uh, in Acts 26, 16, uh, I, I, I printed these out because they're imperatives. That means they're commands that God gives us. They're not on that list at all. I've only got three copies, but I'll give you uh, copies if you want this. He says this. He said, you must rise up. You must stand up on your feet. Uh, he's given us a command. To, to rise up and stand up for a reason. He says, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose. God came into your life so you'd rise up and stand up. Uh, to make you a minister and both a witness of the things that you have seen and the things which I'm going to show you. So see, we don't have an option about this. How it manifests in our lives is different for every one of us. But we don't have an option. 
John 15, 27 says, you all must bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I don't know where it began for you. I was 25, but it began for Nancy when she was seven. Uh, but it says you must bear witness because you have been with me really your whole life. And I'm, I'm, I'm 76 now, so I've been two-thirds of my life I've been a Christian. And it's been all about bringing people to Jesus as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the fact that I tell others to do this is what Scripture tells me to do. So let's close with a, a prayer. Heavenly Father, you are he who witnessed to us and brought us into the kingdom. Help us to be faithful as we witness in whatever means, whatever way, in whatever fashion you call us to do so, and be faithful to you so that we will be good and faithful servants also. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.